Good morning, Elam Lutheran Church. Members and friends, we are happy to have you join us here on this, the last week in Advent, the fourth Sunday in Advent. Can you believe that Christmas is only a few days away? We're glad to have you with us today. As you can see, we aren't actually worshiping within the sanctuary. However, that doesn't mean that we still aren't active in putting together worship and doing other activities in the community. Beyond the walls of this building, this congregation is alive and well and continues to do the work of serving the gospel in this place. Thanks for joining us today. There are a couple of things I'd like to bring to your attention as we begin our time. Some announcements to get you ready for the Christmas week. So, here's the deal. On Christmas Eve, we're going to have two separate services that you can choose from. We'll have an early service that will be launched by three o'clock in the afternoon. This service will have a special message for the children and it will be uh, lots and lots of singing of Christmas hymns and telling of the Christmas story. If you would like to be a part of that, three o'clock is the time it'll launch and it'll be available from then on, on Christmas Eve. Another service, will be available by eight o'clock. And on that service, we will have communion at the end of it. We will have the readings, we'll have the Christmas hymns, but it will be a slightly different order and it will be a more contemplative service. But at both service, at both services, we will be singing Silent Night and we will be lighting candles. So that means whichever service you choose to tune into, Please have a candle ready so that you can join us, light the candle, and sing along with us on Silent Night. So, that's our Christmas Eve. I know that it hasn't been the tradition at Elam to have a Christmas Day service, but this year we are going to provide a resource that the Synod, the St. Paul Area Synod, has provided. It's a Christmas Day worship service. We will have that available for you at, starting at 9 o'clock on Christmas Day. Hope that you can tune in for that. And one other special resource, on the 27th of December, that Sunday is usually a kind of Lessons and Carol Sunday. It's an in-between. It's the second Sunday of Christmas or the first Sunday of Christmas, as depending on how you're going to count it. But that Sunday, we are going to have a resource from Concordia College in Moorhead. We will hear lots of readings and songs hymns, choir singing. It will be a great resource for our uh, worship on the 27th of December. So just to keep in mind, coming up a couple of things in Christmas Eve, a Christmas Day service, and a special resource, a special um, Lessons and Carols worship on the 27th of December. Lots of things happening and more to tell you about, but that's enough for now. You'll hear more in the weeks ahead. The one thing that I do want you not to forget is that today, this Sunday, we are going to have the first of our listening sessions for the um, budget. So that means that at 11 o'clock today, you can tune in to uh, a, a Zoom listening session to be able to, to ask your questions, to make comments, to help discuss the proposal of the budget for 2021. That meeting will be at 11 o'clock. There was a, a link sent out, and this is just your reminder. If you want to be a part of that uh, budget listening and uh, discussing session, 11 o'clock today. I think these are all the announcements that I want to uh, bring to you this morning. But before we move into worship, let's just take a moment to quiet our minds and hearts. Take a deep breath and just center ourselves as our worship begins.
Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, creator of the universe. Elizabeth's son, John, calls all people to prepare the way of the Lord, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Bless us as we light these candles on this wreath. Baptize us with the fire of your spirit, and may we be light shining in the darkness, welcoming others as Christ has welcomed us. For he is our light and our salvation. Blessed be God forever. Amen. We continue our worship with the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whose forgiveness is sure, and whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Together, let us honestly and humbly confess that we have not lived as God desires. Loving and forgiving God, we confess that we are held captive by sin. In spite of our best efforts, we have gone astray. We have not welcomed the stranger. We have not loved our neighbor. We have not been Christ to one another. Restore us, O God. Wake us up and turn us from our sin. Renew us each day in the light of Christ. Amen. People of God, hear this good news. By God's endless grace, your sins are forgiven, and you are free, free from all that holds you back, and free to live in the peaceable realm of God. May you be strengthened in God's love and comforted by Christ's peace and may you be accompanied by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Join me in the prayer of the day. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. With your abundant grace and might, free us from the sin that would obstruct your mercy, that willingly we may bear your redeeming love into all the world. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading for this day comes from Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time on and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. The Gospel according to Luke, in the first chapter, starting at verse 5. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren. And now both were getting on in years. Once, while well he, that being Zechariah, was serving as priest before the Lord God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of people were praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to their Lord, their God. With the spirit of power and of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the dis disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know that this is so? For I am an old man, and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, 
which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zachariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he could not speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months, she remained in seclusion. She said, this is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God, our Creator, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit who dwells among us. What must it have been like to be the parents of John? We don't know much about his childhood. All we have is a throwaway verse at the end of Luke's first chapter. The child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day he appeared publicly to Israel. I'm thinking about that strong in spirit, and then it might be code for a few different things. There's the idea that he was strong in the Holy Spirit, certainly. But there's also the strong-willed child. The child who says far too soon, I do it myself, Mommy. The child who rejects the traditional expectations of society. The child who is neurodiverse and has a fairly unique view of the world and finds the standard mold of how the world is supposed to work perplexing and goes their own way. What must have it have been like to be the parents of John? After such a long wait for a child, a child whose life they had imagined thousands of times, imagined how their family would feel, what it would look like, how it would work. Then they had the reality of John. Thinking back to those other stories that we've had during our series of peculiar treasures, John is not the shy, obedient Isaac. John is not the rule-following, attentive Samuel. John is a completely different child than either of those. How was this strong-willed John, this boy who was drawn into the wilderness, how would a child like that fulfill this promise given by the angel Gabriel? That again, that he would turn many people of Israel to the Lord their God. When it was clear that John was not going to follow his father, Zechariah, into the priestly order of Abijah, how did Elizabeth and Zechariah feel about that? Many of you know how Elizabeth and Zechariah felt because you've been there, anxious, worried, confused, embarrassed, disappointed, angry. You want good things for your child. And you're familiar with basically one way of how you go on that route to have that good life. But no matter how much direction you try to provide, your child goes their own way. I've talked with other writers who struggle 
with their characters that they're creating as if they are their children. They'll say things like, I had a whole plan for my character and now that character is insisting they are a different gender. Or instead of being an only child, they now have this sibling who shows up and keeps causing problems and interfering with my story. Or, I, you know, they just keep talking their way out of trouble when I meant this to be an action-adventure book. So if even authors find their creations diverging from the plan, why do parents think that they can do better? How did Elizabeth and Zachariah hold on and trust that their son was becoming the very person God needed right then? Especially when it was in ways that they had not imagined would be the case. Perhaps Zachariah, having lost the ability to speak from when Gabriel spoke with him until the time John was born and his name was announced. Perhaps that time of not being able to speak trained Zachariah to listen more, to reflect more, to let go of thinking that he was in control. Perhaps for both of these faithful people, they had to lean into their faith even more. That above all, they were recognizing that God's ways are not human ways and that God is God and they were not. And to trust that the spirit of God is at work but that spirit is not something we as human beings can control or tame. Perhaps eventually, they were even able to really support John in becoming the person he was meant to be rather than how they envisioned he should be. To be in that place of supporting him for who he was meant to be in his own way was an act of great faithfulness, particularly as I'm sure others looked on and judged this wild child of theirs. That type of faithfulness may feel really far away right now. We are like Elizabeth and Zachariah because we are in the midst of this time when we are being asked to trust in the midst of everything feeling like it shouldn't be this way. But for us, instead of trying to understand this one child named John that God had a particular plan for, we're trying to understand what God has in mind for us as a community of faith. And it's natural, incredibly natural, during this time of chaos to want to control, to want at least a few things to make sense and be predictable. And the longer we're in the midst of this pandemic, the more we hunger for that order and for that control. And the more we hunger for things to be like they were, to be like we imagined they could be, were it not for this pandemic. Every day, though, we're coming face to face with just that one more thing that we realize we actually have no control over whatsoever. But this time is also an opportunity it's an opportunity to remember that God is God and we are not. An opportunity to trust God. An opportunity to strengthen our face, faith because we are in the midst of people and institutions and businesses and governments and all sorts of things that are not as they were and will be different moving forward. And recognizing that is an opportunity 
to expand and deepen and strengthen our faith together as community. As we look at Elizabeth and Zachariah as, as those who can point the way of how you hold on when you don't understand how this is going to work, but you have trust in God that it will. There are things going on in our world we don't understand. But this is also an opportunity time to be like John for us as the church. Like that unconventional man who pointed the way to Christ, we as a community of faith are finding ways to point toward Christ, recognizing that we are simply the one that tells the story that clears the way, that makes people hear anew this old, old story. And so during this time, I pray that you may keep your faith strengthened, even in this world that isn't what you expected. That you may find comfort in the truth that the Spirit of God is strong and will work through all things and in all things toward the kingdom of God. And for this we say, Amen. I also want to take a moment to thank you for your generosity. Thank you for the ways that you financially support the ministries of Elam Lutheran and the work that we are doing in this crazy world right now. Thank you also for the prayers that you continue to pray and for the ways you find to support one another uh, in this time. Thank you again and know that uh, giving can be done online. We have a secure way of doing that uh, or by, by mail or by other direct deposit means. Thank you again. We continue now with the prayers of the people. Each prayer response will end with, Hear us, O God, and I ask you to respond with, Your mercy is great. God of power and might, fulfill your promise and come quickly to this weary world. Hear our prayers for everyone in need. Gracious God, all generations call you blessed. In this holy season, we pray for our neighbors of other denominations and faiths including Tu Vien Vat Fat Buddhist Temple in Hugo, St. Francis Xavier Catholic Church in Schaefer, Forest Hills Methodist Church in Forest Lake. Inspire the faith of their people. Cultivate understanding among us and strengthen us in love and service to our community. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Creator God, Everything we have belongs first to you and is yours. Bless and protect the seas, mountains, plains, forests, skies, and soils that surround us. Give us humility as we tend to them. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Righteous God, you humble the powerful and lift up the lowly. We pray for the leaders of all nations. Smooth the leadership transition at our federal level, 
so the needs of our nation's people continue to be met. Give our Governor Tim Walls wisdom like Solomon as he and other Minnesota leaders work to balance the needs of public safety, livelihoods, and our hunger for community. Guide all people entrusted with leadership to create societies in which everyone can flourish. Hear us, O God, for mercy is great. Compassionate God, you raise the poor from the dust and lift the needy from the ash heap. Nourish those who, who lack access to adequate food and nutrition. Bless the work of advocates, community organizers, and food pantries. Encourage others to provide for their neighbors in need. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Healing God, pour out your mercy to all who cry out to you. Surround everyone in need of healing in body, mind, or spirit with your tender presence, especially all those who have contracted the COVID-19 virus. For Denise, who is having surgery, for Taylor, who will soon receive stem cells, for others in our, in our community, Chris, John, Marlis, and Larry. Sympathy for the families of Paul Clark, Robert Beckman, and Gloria Carp Carpentier following their passing. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Eternal God, you are faithful to the promises you made to our forebearers. We give thanks for the ministry of Katerina von Bora, Luther, and other ancestors who organized, planned, dreamed, encouraged, and reached out as they served you. We give thanks for the bold leadership of female leaders in our own time. Inspire others with their steadfast witness. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Draw near to us, O God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger in any way, that all may know your care and prepare us now to feast on the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering all that our Lord and Savior has taught us, let us pray the prayer that he has taught us as well. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Stay in peace, go in peace, wherever you are, go and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you.